ask some other yeah, questions. Yeah, cool. So, what's on people's Thank minds? You. I have a question. Yes. So I um, am at Carson. I'm sure you know. Yeah. Silicon Valley Foundation. Yeah. Um, he was rec- uh, a few months ago. He was on a panel, and um, it was it was interesting. It was he, another head of a nonprofit, and then a, a business leader, and um, the um, the person who was next to head of a nonprofit was sort of complaining indirectly about the trouble she was having in terms of raising funds for her specific issue Mm -hmm. um, in Silicon Valley. And um, Emmett likes to be a little bit confrontational, but I I actually think he's a very, very smart guy. And, you know, he he turned to her and to the audience and basically said, you know, if you want to raise money in Silicon Valley or in, frankly, in the United States, you need to be best in class. Mm -hmm. And I'm well, I think in Silicon Valley we um, <coughs> reward high achievers <laughs> in the, in the private uh, in the private sector as well as in the social sector. Um, but I think it goes back to the measurement and evaluation. Mm-hmm. Can someone demonstrate that they're really having the impact they hope to and plan to and want to use your resources for? Yeah. And I think I think what he was saying though was it's not it's not enough simply to move the needle. You've got to be moving the needle better than other people are moving the needle was the implication of what he was of what was saying, which is why I yeah. absolutely love yeah. I mean I think clearly anybody who wants best wants to be in something that's moving the needle. Right. It's just you have to be best in doing it and moving the needle. So so I so I would agree, Michelle, because it, it's it's not just intent, because yeah. lots of people have yeah. great intent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. right. It's yeah. got it has to be compelling. Yes. Yeah. And well do you have to be doing it better than other people who are trying to work in the same place? <coughs> Well, and also how broadly are you operating too? Because some people are very focused on a narrow segment and they may be extremely effective in that. And, that, and some other people prefer more holistic solutions too. You know, they might say um, in, in an education, we would like to go into a school and make sure we are addressing all the needs of the schools, parent involvement and attendance and you know, enrichment programs. And others would say, you know, I just want to be involved in making sure that kids can read by fourth grade, and that's my sole focus. So, some um, I think it also depends on the model in which uh, an organization is operating. Um, but I do think people want to demonstrate that they're uh, want want that demonstrated to them that the impact is significant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> we all want to be a plus. All our children are above. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, just ask me. <laughs> Everyone's kids here, I know, we're all above average. (laughs) Uh, What kind of metrics do you look for for your projects? So we, um, the way we approach our uh, grant making is we look, we'll we'll find if it's a topic, let's say, um, let's find a great one. Well, one that I just love because it was the first one I was involved in. We were looking at the problem of you're losing 50% of your teachers in the first five years. That's a scary. Yeah. That's a scary statistic. Fifty percent of teachers are gone within five years. For like a unified school district mm-hmm. or a particular yep. school. Yep. Hmm. Yep. That's a great. One. Well, why? So we were looking at how to and, and what's being done to solve that. And so a lot of it is the youngest teachers get in the worst performing schools, mm-hmm. and they are not supported. They don't. They feel isolated. They have no mentors. They don't have a lot of tutoring. They're sort of shoved into a classroom, and that's extent and they don't have necessarily the tools. So we were looking at organizations that were trying to address that particular teacher, professional development, sort of indoctrination in professional mm-hmm. development side, found some great organizations in here. Uh, one, a funding one called Reach Institute, which has a very profound mentoring program for young teachers. They're working in East San Jose charter okay. schools. But they also realize that they're is ability for teachers to get funding if they get get more income because they're also start we're starting our young teachers too yes. they don't get enough pay yeah. but if they get a certification they can then qualify for enhanced compensation so the money we have reached they used to develop kind of a fast track certification program so the teachers can get in and move through this program and get certified so then they, not only are they getting tutored along the way, mentored along the way, they then get their certification so they're better able to get into a higher paying job within a couple of years. 
So that's something that's moving the needle in reach. We gave them $120,000. They now got a $7 million social innovation fund grant. Mm -hmm. So wow. they're going to take this model and start putting it in. We started, they were in East San Jose, and now they're up in Oakland, they're in San Francisco, they're in San Mateo County, in Santa Clara County, and they're going to be able to move it to other areas. So that's where you find a model that can have that kind mm -hmm. of profound change, and we try and look at can it scale. So that's one of the things. And sometimes they don't, scaling can either be replicating, going into a lot more schools, or it can be going deeper into a community or an issue and trying to make really profound change there. So that's how we, it's, it's got a different measurement, whether it's deeper, yes. wider, broader, but it's all, can you, can you start to reach the scalability point? And how much monitoring of that do you do? We um, usually, that's where <laughs> kind of informally after our three year, turns out very often an SB2 partner goes on the board, um, mm -hmm. partners, and even, even organizations we meet during our grant round that may not have gotten a grant, people fall in love with them and, and they follow them and get involved. Mm -hmm. So we track the ones that we have funded um, and we do some case, we, we do case studies of virtually all of them so that we're getting a good repository of our portfolio. And then there's an organization, SV2 is one of a larger, um, called Social Venture Partners International, SVPI, one more acronym for us to know. Um, and that's SVP, Social Venture Funds Partnerships, throughout the United States and some international. And we've got a conference coming up, an annual one, and we communicate with each other around organizations, what's successful for them, what's scaling. Sometimes we will do a handoff in a way. We're, we've got an organization that's doing well here and they want to expand into another area and we'll make those introductions to those social venture partners there to see if there's a, a way that they can bring them into the community that they're involved in. So we're also trying to get more collaborative on how we scale these very successful nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. It's really profound a stuff. Question that hits very close to home. Um, to what extent are your investee organizations um, challenged by the difficulty of finding great engineering talent? Because I assume a lot of a lot of the strategies of your investee organizations are web-based, or web is a component of them. And I find, as a startup in its eighth year in the yeah. valley, that you know sometimes, and I talk to many other startups at Plug and Play, where my office is. It's very difficult to attract top-notch engineers when you're competing with Google and Facebook yeah. and the like. Right. You know, it's almost better to be in Kalamazoo mm -hmm. yeah. than, than yeah. in the Bay Area because yeah. you're early stage. Do you find that that's something you have to help? I think get talent acquisition, creative? not necessarily, not only of engineers, is an is an issue in nonprofits. And yeah. you do get a lot of kids who will, and I call kids because they're you know a lot of them college graduates, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but who are who are willing to get that one year or two of of service. They really feel strongly that they sure. want to give back, but long term. You know, it's funny because one of the areas we fund is environmental and, and the group we funded this year is called Pie Ranch. Hmm. And they're all about sustainable agriculture. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking that their ED came in and he was like wearing his jeans and his denim shirt. And he's <laughs> like, is this okay if I dress like this, Nancy? I said, you're a farmer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but you're saying the strong mission is actually something that helps to, yeah, yeah, okay, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Huh. But I do know other startups that I'm, I'm associated with that do have issues with budding right. engineers. Yeah. You might get them for a short period of time. Yeah, but we, then we there have to are get very you know, organizations that do provide some help. You know, sort of like Code for America is it's trying to help. I was just I mean, going to mention a great that. Great example it is. of using brilliant engineers. You should tell this audience about them because they're cool. Yeah. Well, but we actually hope to get introduced to them because yeah. the yeah. former yeah. assistant city manager of Palo Alto, who used to work with Jim Keane. Um, she's now gone to the uh, city in the East Bay, but she's on she's one on the advisory board of Code for America, and so they've been very successful at just getting talented engineers to work full time for a year, you know, before they go back to their high paying jobs. And there's so much, so many people are interested in helping local government work more efficiently and pro and more product mm -hmm. more productively. So that's a, that's a great example, but I don't I, I haven't had any conversations yeah. with people directly yet. I mean, there's a case where people give a year and they come up with projects like monitoring. Yeah. What was so much like monitoring um, water hydrant, like because they have to be flushed out, and they came up yeah. with some great web-based tool. <laughs> you know, it's just a bunch of engineers coding away for free, gave it to municipalities yep. to use. So there's people who are willing to put that kind of a time in and create great projects mm -hmm. that can be utilized to make our government more efficient. So 
a lot of ways to get engaged. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of need. There's a lot of need. I have two questions. One is, do you guys uh, work with professional sports teams or leagues? And then the and if so, how do you do that? And then the second thing is, you mentioned that you really work with a lot of best practices and um, obviously measuring outcomes. And a lot of times, nonprofits have a difficult time measuring <coughs> outcomes, right. and for a variety of reasons. But a lot, depending on their community they're serving, they're very transitional. Mm -hmm. um, have you or do you? You had mentioned earlier that um, you do first Friday educational events. Mm -hmm. it sounds like for people that are interested, in maybe being partners. Mm -hmm. but, um, or existing partners. Or existing partners. Yeah, they come in just to learn about a topic of okay. interest. You you know, Sal Khan from Khan Academy came recently okay. just to talk about online learning and what, what Khan So Academy now is that open to, to just the public? Okay, so I'm, yeah. to share those. So that's yeah. what I was wondering. Is yeah. Then do you share what these best practices that you're seeing in organizations that you're funding to the public in some capacity? We haven't made the best practices. Uh, we haven't yet gotten to that stage where we're actually incorporating them. It's probably in our case studies where we have that kind of information, but we haven't yet. Um, because we create, in some instances, collaborations with other nonprofits. And we, um, for example, we had two other foundations help us in making a number of grants. We would make one education grant a year. We got um, larger foundations to support eight other ones for out of school time issues, trying to deal with the achievement gap that broadens for lower income kids when they lack enrichment programs out of after school in the summer. So we were able to find nine out of school time programs and then we put a collaborative together with the facilitator that um, a large foundation funded so that the executive directors could meet quarterly. Matter of fact, they were forced to meet quarterly to share their best practices, you know, to take that day out of their time and talk about what's working and what was not working. And they were then starting to develop and codify some of the practices that they're doing. So it comes out of the nonprofits, and we haven't yet become the repository, but we're one of the things we're working on. So okay. before you and then we do not have a sports, um, professional sports team affiliation. We have funded a group called BOSI, Bay Area Women's, Women's sports, sports Initiative. Initiative. That was an SB2 grantee okay. from years okay. back. Yeah. So, and just speaking on professional sports teams, if anybody's watching the uh, the, the scores on, <laughs> don't, don't, don't say it, right? Uh, it's being DVR'd, yeah, please. Yeah, no DVR'd, update so on don't, the score. So no updates on, and, and she, we promise you that. In advice is don't listen to the radio on the way home. Yeah, it's already <laughs> off. Yeah, exactly. Bobby. I'm just really interested as to why only nonprofits. I mean, that's obviously your mandate, but why? Why is that? We are. It, it, right now, it is our current. We are a five hundred one c three that's only granting to it. But one thing we're looking at is: are there other vehicles like? PRIs, are there other you know, ways that you can get other capital that might have a return? Um, so we're constantly trying to see what's going on in the market, you know, trying to learn about social impact bonds and things like that to see if that's really going to be a probable tool mm -hmm. because how many, you know, it's, it's the financial levers. So. Yeah, so remember, it's that, it's that IRS. Yeah. Uh, um, dividing line is makes, makes it really. And I do, I serve on the board of another organization on SB2 called Embrace. And Embrace came out of the Stanford um, uh, Graduate School of Business, a program called Design for Extreme Affordability. Mm -hmm. And the challenge they give a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. group of students is take a product that works in the developed world and do it for 1% of the cost in the developing world. Mm -hmm. And Team em now Embrace, the product was an incubator. So 24-7 electricity. Um, it does a lot of things because it will monitor oxygen and other metrics on a, a, a low birth weight baby, but their challenge runs about $20,000. So the challenge was to come up with something at 1% of the cost, and they've done it. Yeah. But the interesting thing, they spent five years kind of in product, not just product development, but product testing. <coughs> what they realized, kind of the, 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 the disruptive moment for them is they went out to Nepal and were talking to women with um, very, very dire, um, mothers and infant mortality rates, and realize that these babies are hypothermic. And so they either develop, have long-term developmental disabilities, or they're, they die. Or they're just put somewhere that's unsafe, they're put next to a fire, they're put under, if there's electricity, they might be under a light bulb. And if you've um, been in India or places where you know where the power supply is so erratic, they could burst. 
Um, so, but the, the real reason they needed warmth, these babies were so cold, so they said, ah, 80 to 90 percent of using incubators is to keep them warm, we'll solve for warmth. So they took a phase change material, which I call like a paraffin wax, it's in, it's in a packet. Um, if there's any electricity, you have almost like a waffle iron that you can heat it with, and then there's a little sleeping bag that you can slide it in. And if there's no electricity, you can use hot water and pour it on it, and it holds body temperature for four to six hours. Mm -hmm. So that you can then swaddle these babies and these women in rural India and Nepal and Somalia and, and places like that can, can one swaddle them and put them down while they're attending their other children, their crops, or you know whatever they're doing to try and maintain um, their lifestyle. So Embrace was really trying to get this product worked, and there are places to sell the product. There is a market in low in hospitals. There's a market in rural areas that they can sell it to, and there's a market where there is no money available. So they have become a hybrid organization. They have a for-profit arm and it's been funded by Vinod Khosla's social investment fund, and Jeff Skoll, who was the founder of eBay, his mm -hmm. social investment fund, gave them venture capital, and they are truly a for-profit, and they are supposed to sell a lot of baby warmers <laughs> and get them into distribution, and they have deals with GE Healthcare and all. And then there is a not-for-profit, not -for which is trying to participate in those areas in the world where there is no money, there, there is no funds available to buy in. So they're trying to put together these, they have this hybrid organization, for profit, not for profit, and we're kind of learning the rules on that because, yeah. to your yeah. point, there's this dividing line, and we're well, like, so, so, you, you, and uh, Zoe Hunton, who, who I know you know, yeah. yes, I right? saw she, her today. Oh, you saw her today? <laughs> At IDO. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, she 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 prefers to use the the word. I think it's tandem yeah. organization tandem rather than tandem. hybrid because right. they're not. They're not hybrid. They are right? not. They are two. They're, they're, they're two, two separate, separate entities. Distinct. So it's tandem true. is a very. It's a better word. I, better, I actually better. looked at when I set up our block, which you know in the first four years was called E Block, because the social side was so strong in what we were doing. I considered a dual entity structure, mm -hmm. and I actually met with the head of the nonprofit practice at uh, a legal firm in San Francisco called Koblenz, Patch, Duffy, and Bass, mm -hmm. and she actually advised me. I had this notion of. E block initiatives. It was E block instead of R block, and and E block technologies being the for profit side, and I looked into all the restrictions that you'd have to have on inter entity transfers, you know, because that can get really very very yeah. uh, sort of hair raising, and yeah. you know, to basically respect all of the legal aspects of two very different kinds of entities. And she said to me, "Look, if you have a, a strong ROI based model that you think can scale," she advised me just to do a for profit. Uh, entity and not have to keep, yeah. you know, raising money uh, at, a, at, a, at a real frequent pace, you know, on the nonprofit side. Yeah, and Zoe, Zoe too is right. Her her advice to a lot of these startups is, and especially on the social venture side, mm -hmm. is simplicity. Oh, sure, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, and, yeah. and you know, she says with any organization, for profit, not for profit, it's got to be. Uh, it's got to well, it's got to be profitable. Mm -hmm. Right, we can't. We've got to run again. It's the financial model. The under, the financial underpinnings of any organization are so critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't cash flow, mm -hmm. it stops. Right. Yeah. And so she's like, keep it simple. It's worry true. about some of these other st structures later. Yeah, right. exactly. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Susan. Early in the presentation, you indicated that there was a difference between impact investing and investing. Now, maybe I missed the differentiation, but could someone define that? Yes. So, 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 impact investing is is a is a is 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 the hot term that talks about investing in for-profit companies, right? It's investing in a for-profit company, but but some of that return is is. Is cr the the critical part of it is it's it's returning social capital, but they're for profit companies. You take an equity position or or a debt position. You're actually it it actually is a for profit company. You can't take equity positions in in nonprofits. You you don't in a nonprofit you don't have the possibility of taking money back out. So remember, as I as yeah. I mentioned, right? It's yeah, the whole got the it. critical thing about and and right. a financial investment is how you get money out, and with a nonprofit, the answer is you don't. Got it. 
And I, so we invest in nonprofits for the impact. So we're investing for impact. Got it. But the impact investing has got to be on the on the uh, for profit side. Right. Yeah. So, so what if the nonprofit is building, helping build businesses? Because, that, that, because yes. then you get the, can't, can't someone come in and invest in the, in the actual businesses that you're building? I mean, there's a new rule where you can actually put investment money into a nonprofit that's building out for profit enterprises. Is that not, is that not the case? I mean, this is getting complicated, I know, but I, I think there is. I do not believe there is. It's still you're, you're start. You might so start to see these. Which is it? B Corp. Is a social. No, no, it's a, it's a non. So it's a non-profit, say based in yeah. the U.S. That's yeah. building out businesses and for-profit enterprises in the developing world, for example. Yeah. So so, so again, it's, it's um, so the cr the critical um, piece. Well, see, like Mercado Global is building economic uh, capability in Guatemala. I visited but them this summer. Mercado Global? Or? In, in Guatemala. Oh, you did? Wow. This is an amazing okay. organization. What's it called again? Mercado Global. Global. Oh, you mentioned, yeah. And they are up, they are working um, with some of the poorest people I've ever visited. Wow. They're up in the Guatemalan highlands. And these are indigenous Mayan women. And uh, they have been, there's been so much bias against them oh, for gosh. so long. And then a 36 year civil war. Uh, and they have just so little, but they have incredible incredible craft skills. They do these beautiful weavings and embroidery and jewelry making, but there is no market. They find roads, <laughs> you know, they just, it is really um, a very, very poor environment. And they had a, a long civil war and all of them were touched. Either family members were murdered, there was a lot of rape, there's just incredible issues. And this woman, young woman, Ruth Degolia, came as a Yale student yeah. to do some research there and just had this absolute, wait, what they need is a market. <laughs> yeah. To the right, extent right. they would sell, it, they would sell through intermediaries right. who would pay, pay them maybe a little yeah. or not at all. Right, right. Or they'd go into their little Logan Panahajal market and they'd sell for a dollar or something that had spent like you know a week weaving and all. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. and so she has spent the last nine yeah. years building a market, but she also has to make the goods acceptable to U.S. because yeah. you can't have a pity purchase. I mean, you might buy once, you know, well, that makes me feel good, but it has to be goods that are really um, consumable by American consumers. So she's yeah. brought an amazing woman out of Ralph Lauren down, who's living in Guatemala right now, teaching these women. And the women didn't know, like, like scarves, Levi's, they didn't know they all had to be the same size. Because they're weaving them by hand, and if one's this, one's that. Well, no, Levi's wants every one of them had to be. And so they had to buy that, you know, had to help them get these measuring sticks. And these women are weaving with these backstrap looms. They just, they tie them up, and they just crouch down on their knees for hours on end weaving this. Yeah, yeah so Ruth has gone through some really interesting stories, right? So one, one of the things she told me, too, is she said she had to work with the women on their color selection, because if she left the color selection up to it's them... Vibrant. It's not yeah, you, not you. Color. <laughs> <laughs> and they are in Guatemala. It is they will have embroidered here on a on a different pattern with a different embroidered belt with a different pattern skirt, and they consider that beautiful. It's yeah, very, that's right. it's very beautiful for them. If you put them in Manhattan, it's you know, or if you put them in Union Square, no one's going to buy those things. So they have to get them in the color selection. And, yeah. but, but back to your question, Bobby, I think from the, from the IRS's perspective, I believe it's still pretty clear about, you know, it, it, is, it a, is it a donation where you're, where you're yeah. you know, no, giving up? No, I mentioned up? that the other day, so I was just, I wondered if anyone, I, I, I need to investigate further. Yeah, because I, I understand what you're saying, but they provide yeah. some of the services, but the organization that's yeah. the beneficiary is a for-profit. Yeah. Some of it has yeah. to do with which way the money which is flowing, goes, yeah. you know? Yeah. You, you can't flow back yeah. money into yeah. a nonprofit. Yeah, okay. Um, I have run for for profit and uh, impact on non profit organization. And uh, going back to your scale, uh, one of the differences in the non profit sector, especially in the music space, uh, I have run music education uh, non profit 501c3, but there is very few uh, commonly agreed metrics as to how to mm -hmm. measure the performance of music focused <laughs> um, mm -hmm. non profit organizations. Um, for the impact, investment you can measure the environmental impact by uh, carbon dioxide or <laughs> <laughs> you know the people impact by the wage increase and things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. but uh, especially in this education space there is mm -hmm. hardly 
a you know, effort to standardize some of the measures and metrics so that we can you know, even race each other for better performance. Right. That's the holy grail, measurement and evaluation. I mean, it, is such, it really is. I'm, yeah. I'm, I hope there's a lot of really smart people figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to learn from them. <laughs> but, you know, really, it's, no, but it's, it's a serious problem. I mean, you really have to do that. And I know there's a lot of smart people trying to figure this out. So I'm going to learn from them, too. Yes. Thank you so much. This is yeah. so helpful to hear you and so Thank inspiring you. to hear about what you're doing to make Thank a difference you. in the world. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about venture philanthropy. You mm -hmm. kind of touched on it earlier. Mm -hmm. And I've had the good fortune of working for two different kinds of nonprofits. The Nature Conservancy, which was a very established mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. And I did actually work for them in Texas. And I now work for an organization, which is a startup nonprofit here in Silicon Valley called the Clean Coalition. And so if you could give me your words of wisdom with a startup nonprofit, kind yeah. of what you would, with regards to venture philanthropy, any strategies that you would have for an organization like ours, I would really appreciate that. Well, I think understanding sort of the ecosystem of where there are the seed capital, you know, if you, if you use that venture capital model, there's sort of the seed funds, right. kind of the Draper Richards Kaplan that come yeah. in, they'll fund a business plan. And then you look at the next organizations, sort of the SB2 and SB2-like, um, that will fund kind of the capacity building once you've got something mm -hmm. that's going. And then right. you move up to some of the other well, larger foundations, yes. some of which, like Enda McConnell McClark Foundation, has now realized that scaling nonprofits is a really important thing. They're an enormous corp uh, foundation, but they have a whole area devoted to scaling up nonprofits. Kind of getting that lay of the land and then understanding where your organization is in terms of where they might be. but Because um, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about and trying to put a lot of my energy in is how do we make sure that all of these different levers can be brought to play more effectively to make sure these things really, these really great ideas um, and great organizations can go there. Because they're, they're creating jobs too. I mean, they are creating jobs. And they are making impact. So it's a really important thing. So there's, it's kind of the whole ecosystem kind of helps so to kind of build on the question and yeah. back to, to Marcotto Global, mm -hmm. so I was sitting in a Marcotto Global meeting and, and asked one of the people that worked there, you know, it's like, okay, you're, you're in a Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, Levi, how did you do that? Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and the, the answer that the person gave me was, she goes, Ruth was very thoughtful about how she built her board. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, board governance is a key it's issue for a nonprofit in terms of what, what networks are you tapping into, yeah, yeah. what expertise do you need to have. It's one of the key factors to success or, or not success. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Is, yeah. 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 So, so um, it's probably a good time to break. Do you have to rush yeah. off or do you have time to stay for a little while and nope. chat? Yeah, a little moment, yeah. Sure. So, so I, I think we all want to thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.